Morning. Today we're going to talk about this guy right here. <laughs> what is this? I call this the AR RPK. Now before we get started, the range is clear. Nothing in the chamber, but there is ammunition in the magazine, so I'm going to keep it pointed down range just to be safe. Now, I call this the AR RPK. <coughs> this is a... I set this up to be a light support weapon for uh, prepared citizens. Uh, now, I didn't invent this concept. Uh, a company called uh, Klein Machining, they've been putting out uppers that look a lot like this for some time now. Uh, most recently he's been using uh, RPK bipods. Uh, he was using M60 bipods for a while and those look pretty, uh, pretty rad. But uh, they pretty much dried up. Now this is not a Klein machine. This is something I put together myself. Uh, the reason I put this together myself is because uh, if you go to his website, his uppers, just uppers, not a bolt carrier group, not a uh, charging handle, are like twelve to fourteen hundred dollars. I think they're worth it. I'm not saying they're not worth it, but I'm not going to pay uh, twelve to fourteen hundred dollars when I can just I have the skills and the abilities to make it myself. So. Uh, I made my own. Um, now he uses a little bit better barrel than what I am using. He has a uh, chrome line uh, 24 inch barrel that's literally an inch thick. <laughs> that thing is, I think, the chunky boy. Uh, it, it's a one inch thick uh, bull barrel. Um, I found a 24 inch bull barrel that's similar dimensions to his, but mine is uh, nitride. You know, he offers the barrels that he sell that he offers on his uh, uh, uppers. He he'll sell you just the barrel, but it's like 260 bucks. I was able to find this one for like 125. So uh, just by putting it together myself, I was able to kind of cut the cost in half. Now, again, I'm not saying don't buy his uppers at all. I think they're I think they're great. I'm just saying that I had the ability to, and most of the parts laying around to be able to make my own. Now, again. This is a weapon that's not for sporting, it's not for competition, it's not for hunting. This is solely for the uh, prepared citizen. You know, a little bit extra firepower. And since we can't have belt-fed machine guns like men, we gotta do goofy shit like this. Now, again, the whole purpose of this thing is to have an upper that I can throw on and uh, have a little bit, a weapon that's capable of a little bit higher rate of fire than your standard uh, AR. Um, now there are other companies making uh, uppers like this. Uh, a company called Red Right Hand. You know they make uh, what they call the I think the IAR Recce, something like that. They're they're comparable to the uh, Klein machine uppers. You know I think the longest barrel length I saw that they offered was like a 20 inch barrel. Uh, but they're they're pretty much standard barrels, but they use this like heat sink. Uh, aluminum heat sink underneath the handguard to try to dissipate, dissipate some of the heat rather than just a thicker barrel. Um, I saw that set up before on like a uh, JP uh, Enterprise gun and it, it, I'm not saying, I'm not talking anything on the red right hand uppers. I don't have any experience with them. I'm just saying that type of technology I've seen used before and it wasn't fantastic. <laughs> so I would, if it was me, uh, if I was going to spend $1,400 for a uh, uh, light support weapon upper. I would just go with the the Klein machine. Get get the thicker barrel rather than you know some goof, goofy heat mitigation system. Now the red right hands are piston, so the uh, they're piston driven. If that matters to you, uh, the ones from Klein machine or uh, direct impingement. So I would prefer the direct impingement with an actual thick barrel than some. Uh, piston driven thing with a uh, heat mitigation system. That's just my own personal preference. If you wanted to make something, uh, wanted to pull one of these together yourself. Now, this type of weapon will fill the role of the automatic rifleman. If you're not familiar with what the automatic rifleman is, uh, I'll put a couple links down below uh, for you to check out. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice concept. It's a nice uh, theory, uh, way of doing things. Uh, <coughs> For years, the automatic rifleman in the uh, Marine Corps, for decades really, was the uh, squad automatic weapon, the M249 saw. That's what I used. Uh, you know, belt-fed machine gun using 5.56. You know, 
nothing wrong with that system, but again, as you know, John Q. Citizen, we can't have bell-fed machine guns. So, you know, we have to resort to something closer along the lines of the RPK. The RPK was just basically an AKM that was beefed up, heavier barrel, longer barrel, thicker receiver with, uh, you know, 40-round mags like this, just to present a little bit higher rate of fire than your standard AKM. It's a nice idea because you got a little bit more uh, rate of fire out of that, uh, you know, infantry unit. Uh, without having anything specialized. You know, you can maintain that weapon with the same materials and magazines that was being used for your regular infantry rifle. And that's kind of the benefit of this guy right here is, I say it all the time, if you were to go into 10 houses on my block, seven of them probably have ARs. Uh, you know, so having some goofball support weapon that can't be supported by the items organic to your neighborhood is kind of dumb. So. Having something like this, you get a little bit more uh, firepower, uh, and you can still use the same materials, uh, organic to your neighborhood, your community, whatever you want to say, to uh, you know support it. Magazines, spare parts, things like that. Now, I'm going to go through this, what I did with this guy, just so that you know everybody's clear on why this is a little bit better than just doing something like having a 20-inch... Uh, uh, government profile barrel that you threw some bipods on yeah so the first thing is the barrel all right we'll start we'll start with the barrel so again 24 inch bull barrel this is about a one inch thick barrel this gas block here 0.936 this is a chunky boy it gets a little bit thicker past that so it's almost a one inch barrel from the chamber all the way to the end so it can handle a lot of heat uh it has uh I put M72 uh, bipods on it. These are surplus bipods I had laying around. I had a Yugo M72 uh, kit, you know, the Yugo RPK that I turned into a carbine a couple years ago and had these laying around the shop. So I put these military spec bipods on just because they are rugged and, you know, they swivel. So you can do things like uneven terrain, uh, you know, tilt for a reload, things like that. Now, Keyboard warrior is gonna jump in like, well, you got those bipods on the muzzle, you're gonna have uh, impact shift. Who gives a shit? <laughs> you know, if my impact shifts uh, one MOA at 100 yards and this is a high volume fire weapon, does, does it really fucking matter? They've been using bipods like this on the RPK for, you know, how many decades? And it's, it's fine for the, the application. This is not a precision rifle, this isn't a DMR. This is an area denial weapon, meaning that I'm putting a shitload of uh, ammunition into one specific area to try to deny targets. You know, try to keep heads down. That's that's the purpose of this. You know, it's it's been working for decades. It's going to work on this application here. So, now climb machine, the way they do it, they use RPK bipods in their uh, current uh, guns. They machine it down, and then they use a lock collar in front. Now, I didn't want to make my own lock collar, so what I did, and I'll have another video after this with a little bit more details, I had the M72 bipods laying around, and I had a junk uh, uh, RPK uh, front sight. So what I did, now, getting into some of the particulars here, the RPK front sight diameter is like 14.5 uh, millimeters. It's a little bit thicker than the uh, M72 for some reason. Even though the M72 has a much thicker barrel than the Romanian RPK, when it goes down to the front sight in a bipod, it gets extremely skinny. I don't know why they did that back in the day, but they did. So I took the Romanian RPK uh, front sight, I chopped off the front sight part, and I pressed it on just to make it a lock collar. And then I had the uh, bipod portion here machined down to 14 millimeters and then I just cut a new channel right here so that makes it a lock collar and then I threaded it down to 28 by uh, what is it half inch by 28 just so that I can put a muzzle device on now I figure since I'm already sending this out to my machinist I may as well put a uh, silencer co muzzle device on so I can use my suppressor all right so I've got 24 inch bull barrel M72 RPK style bipods and a suppressor mount. Now moving back here, again this gas block 0.936 and this is a uh, aero precision you know that's the only gas block I could find that big and I went ahead and I penned it. Now 
people will say, well, you don't really need to pin your gas block. The set screws will work just fine if you dimple them. Maybe, but why take the chance? Especially when the gas block needs to be exposed because it's so goddamn heavy, you know, so thick. <laughs> why take the chance? You know, it took me like 10 minutes to drill and pen it. So <laughs> now it's extra secure. All right, now again, since this thing is so thick, the longest handguard I could use was a 12 inch. So this is a 12 inch uh, Daniel Defense uh, Slimline handguard, probably like seven, eight years old with uh, key mods on it. You know, the uh, Klein machines, I think they offer DPMS handguards, which nothing wrong with them, but I feel like I got a better handguard in this situation here. Now, again, this is so thick, you can't populate this like a normal uh, AR, you know, where you populate the barrel and then you just slide the handguard over it. Now you had to install the barrel first, put the handguard in, and then do all the work after the handguard was on just because this is so goddamn thick. <coughs> now the weakest point of an AR, direct impingement AR, is the gas tube. That's by design. They do that so that if you have some kind of uh, you know, high rate of fire, the first part that's going to blow is the gas tube simply because it'll protect the rest of the rifle. Now, since this is a rifle specifically designed for a higher rate of fire, you know, having the gas tube be uh, steel or melanite really wasn't advantageous to the purpose of it. So I got an Inconel uh, gas tube, which is a high heat metal that will take quite a bit of rounds. Uh, that was very expensive. That was like 80 bucks. All right. So normally a gas tube will run you about 10 to 15, you know, 80 bucks. But again, the purpose of it was to have an Inconel gas tube that can take you know, the higher rates of fire. Now moving back here, this is just an aero precision uh, uh, upper receiver with no forward assist. I've never used a forward assist. Uh, I don't care, you know, the, the crowd out there, they're well, you really should have a forward assist because it's military spec. I don't give a shit. I've never used a forward assist in my life. You know, it's just extra weight to me. I don't, I don't need it. Uh, and it's also more expensive. I think the Aero Precision upper with the Ford Assist was somewhere around 95 and without it was 70 So I saved myself 25 bucks just by not putting on that useless button. <laughs> now, I was able to put all this together roughly around just under $700. So I pretty much cut the cost in half of the Klein machine. Now the Klein machine, I can't say enough. I'm not saying don't buy it. You know, I think it's a really good product. Uh, you can't get it with the M60 bipods anymore. You got to get it with the RPK bipods, but it's still a good product. Uh, their barrels, you know, being chrome lined for this application would be amazing. Again, I went with the nitride just because it was half the cost, and I'm not made of money. You know, I'm not. I don't have a shit ton of money now. Again, utilization of this thing is a little bit different than a rifle. It is an automatic rifle control, but you're using it as a light support. So I'm going to do things like I learned when I carried a saw, which was using a sling. This is an M60 sling, heavily padded. I do what I call purse carry because you're not utilizing it like a regular rifle where you're shouldering it and doing all that stuff. No, you're going to hit the ground with it. You know, you know initial contact. You're going to go from the. You're probably going to go from the hip, lay down some initial suppressing fire, and then you're going to deploy bipods, man, and you're going to hit the ground. So when you hit the ground, the last thing you want is this thing like a traditional sling, and now you're hitting the ground trying to fight it. No, just what we used to do with the saws is just purse carry, slung over one shoulder like that, so that when we hit the ground, you know, it just comes right off, right? You know, you're already in the fight, ready to go. So just something to keep in mind. Just a little bit different, a uh, little bit different uh, manual arm, so to speak, than just a normal a AR because you're not a rifle; you're an automatic rifle. Uh, <coughs> now I don't have it yet. I ordered. Uh, I don't have it yet, but to achieve higher rates of fire, some people use the uh, binary triggers, like the Fostex things like that. I'm not a fan of binary triggers. Uh, I've used them, not my own. I've used friends. You know, you get light primer strikes. Uh, yeah, and they're expensive. They're like 500 bucks, and all it takes is one stroke of a bureaucratic pen and it goes the way of the bump stock and you're out 500 bucks so i'm not a big fan of those so i just got a four pound uh, larue trigger cost me like 100 bucks should be in here today or tomorrow and then i should be able to maintain a pretty good rate of fire just by fast fingering this thing like your mom's pussy you know it's just that four and a half pound trigger will will get a pretty decent rate of fire now 
Again, I can't stress enough, this is not a precision rifle. This is, this is a uh, you know, high volume of fire rifle. You know, you're, you know, I'm not gonna get into cones of fire and stuff like that because it's not really applicable to this, but you are just putting out a lot of fire <laughs> and you know, having, you know, you're not, you're not going to use this as a dual purpose uh, precision rifle, you know, DMR and your light support weapon. No, it's just, they need to be two separate dudes. Now, magazines. If you look up the automatic rifleman, you'll see a bunch of prepared citizens, you know, give them their thoughts on it. You'll hear a lot of them say, well, you need to have the D60, the Magpul D60 drum. I, I hate Magpul magazines and I hate drums. So having a Magpul drum is not something I'm really interested in. So I, I'm going to steer clear of those. I'm not saying they don't work. It's just not my cup of tea. Instead, start off with this guy. This is a 60 round Surefire. Uh, if you remember about 10 years ago, these bad boys were all the rage. Uh, they kind of died out just because people at the time, you know, keep in mind this came out about 2000, I want to say 12-ish, 2011. You know, there really was a big push to make lighter rifles, fighting rifles. So guys were trying to get their fighting rifles down to six pounds or less and then throwing in, you know, twice as heavy 60 round mag was kind of counterproductive to that. So they kind of went by the wayside, but you can still pick them up. I see them on Gunbroker for about a hundred bucks. I think I picked this one up for about 50 ish, uh, three or four years ago. It's just been laying around. So it should be do, do pretty well for this application. now. The rest of my magazines are just uh, 40 round mags. I have about 10 or 12, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 10 or 12 like E ladder uh, Israeli steel mags. And I got, uh, you know, just a mix of these E, e ladder uh, Israeli steel mags and the ACS uh, aluminum mags. Uh, you know, that should suit me fine. Uh, now I have a. Uh, Bravo 3 SIG on here just because I had it laying around. No particular purpose. It's not a fantastic optic, optic but for the purposes, it's going to work just fine. So that's enough with this gun. Now, if you want to learn more about the automatic rifleman in general, uh, I'm going to put some links down below of uh, some pretty good resources. Uh, again, if you search automatic rifleman, you'll have a ton of people uh, that give their two cents on it. Some of it's good, uh, some of it's not so good. Uh, uh, you know, some of it's very dubious, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not saying one source is better than another, but there is one guy named, uh, Dr. Chris Larson. He started the One Shepherd Institute. He has a whole video on it. You know, he's a very smart guy, uh, you know, very professional. You know, he, he does his videos with a suit and tie, if that matters to you. Uh, yeah, so the, the basic theory of the automatic rifleman is, you know, he'll go into that in detail. Uh, again, one a couple of points that he makes in the clips uh, that I'm going to link to. Uh, the first one being that uh, uh, automatic rifleman does not replace a machine gun. They're not interchangeable. All you're doing is just putting another dude in your uh, squad, your team that has the ability for a little bit more firepower. He's not replacing a bell fed machine gun. Uh, another point he makes, and he has no way to quantify this, is where a uh, machine gun team can probably hold off a 10 man squad. You know, I, I believe that's about accurate. Uh, you know, the automatic rifleman could probably hold off a four-man team. You know, so I, I, there's no way to quantify that, but I think that that's an accurate statement. Now, the reason to have this, I'm going to say this again. I didn't build this be, for any other reason than to be a prepared citizen. Uh, we're all of the same opinion that crazy stuff is coming for America. Whatever your favorite conspiracy theory is, it's not off the table. Uh, you know, whatever you want to believe is coming is in the realm of possibility. So, you know, being in a community of uh, like-minded people that want to protect themselves, having a weapon like this is, can only be a benefit. Uh, again, I said it before, and I'll say it a thousand times. There's a lot of ARs in America. If there's ten houses on my block, there's probably seven ARs in those houses. Uh, you know, so if some crazy stuff just kicked off and uh, the dad consortium of my community wants to put together a protection squad, they probably will mostly have ARs. I'm going to show up with this just to give the uh, dad consortium just a little bit extra firepower. Uh, 
yeah, and that's the sole purpose of this. Um, don't let anybody tell you this is stupid or this is gay or this is tactical Timmy bullshit. It, it might be, I don't know, but at the same time, it's the ability to provide a little bit of extra firepower to you know whatever unit of uh, community protection you have cropping up. Uh, again, I built this for about uh, upper only without the bolt carrier for about you know a little under seven hundred dollars. If you don't want to build it, you don't want to source it. You can go to some place like Klein Machine, and you can just buy it outright for twelve hundred if you want. And it's it's just a nice thing to have. Things kicked off, you know, and you you have the ability just to put out some more firepower with the other dads in your neighborhood. <laughs> but I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, again, uh, some other videos are just gonna be a little bit more detailed on the bipod setup. Uh, and then I'm going to go into uh, my gear. I put together a low cost rig specifically for this. Uh, just a little bit beefier, uh, <coughs> a little bit beefier vest setup that was pretty inexpensive compared to a lot of the gear out there. It's not pretty, you know, it, I'm gonna warn you there, but it's effective and it, it'll work. So I'm gonna put some rounds out, get this thing zeroed in, and I'll uh, talk to you guys later. Bye. I think I got about maybe 20 rounds left in this thing. I'm gonna rock and roll it and just see see what's going on. Oh man. Mm. Ooh. Gas air. I always forget about how much gas gets put in your face when you're firing suppressed. I can't see. <laughs> okay, Sergio. All right, so this is just going to be some of the details of the uh, ARRPK. All right, how I affix the bipod, things like that. So it is clear. There's a magazine in it, but there's nothing in it. I just cleared it out. Everybody shut up. So, all right, so close up. Now, what I got, this is the uh, M72 bipods that I laying around my shop. This is the uh, front sight from a uh, uh, Romanian RPK. Uh, I got it, it was damaged, it was, uh, the handguard retainer was cut off, it was, it was scrap. So what I did, which I don't want, is my bipods to spend uh, 360 degrees. I wanted to lock in, so I used this as a lock ring. Now, Romanian RPK uh, barrel, even though the M72 barrel is thicker, when you get to the front sight uh, block in the uh, bipods, it's thinner. I don't know why they do that. They just did. So what we had is this was about 14 and a half inches, you know, diameter of this uh, front sight block. This was about 14, uh, I'm sorry, 14 and a half millimeters, this uh, front sight uh, block. The bipods were about 14 millimeters, and then this needed to be threaded down to a half inch by 28. So what I did was I had my machinist uh, machine this down so that I could press on the uh, rear sight block backwards so that I could use this as like a lock collar to keep this directional. Then I just chopped this off and then mounted the bipod. I just had to cut a new uh, channel in there for the, uh, the collar and then it's being held on by the uh, muzzle device. And it works. Uh, it, it does everything it's supposed to do. Now all I need to do is take more material off so that it matches the contour of the barrel so I can take my gas block off and then I can get my uh, rail on. So it's coming along. Now this is all going to be very, very rough. You know, I, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not looking for pretty here. I'm looking for something I can beat the shit out of. So, you know, it's not, I, I mean, this is not going to be, you know, perfect and flush and look good. And nobody's going to say, like, man, that's some incredible machine work. No, you're going to see fucking tool marks, and you're going to see a shelf here. All I'm looking for is functional, right? So uh, I can make it pretty if I wanted to. It's a lot of time and effort that I don't really want to spend. So that's that's what, we're, that's what the next step is, is to... Hold on. That was a nice truck, square body. 
So next step is to continue to remove material off this front sight block so that it matches the contour of the barrel so that I can get this ginormous gas block off because the rail will not slide over this gas block. And that's where we're at. I'll catch you next when uh, it's all put together. All right, we're gonna try to go through my gear here. My dogs are out here and they're going bananas. So don't be surprised if you see a, a Pomeranian Husky mix or a Labradoodle zoom in the shot every now and then. So bear with me. All right, now again, I wanted to put together a uh, rig specifically for the AR RPK that take the 40 round magazines and I didn't want to spend a lot of money. So I think I got maybe about 150 bucks uh, in the setup altogether. So we'll start off with uh, the vest itself, which is, it's a label here. I don't know what this is. This is an ABU uh, Air Force rig, uh, generation three. Oh, there's Surge. Come on, get out of here, bud. Here, take that. Generation three. I don't know what makes it generation three, but I only pay 20 bucks for it because it's ABU and it's pretty nice. It's got nice solid shoulder pads here uh, nice and padded nice and thick uh, got a lot of real estate to put shit on so for 20 bucks I highly recommend it I'll put a link below uh, to you know like a eBay source where you can find them now here's surge again come on dude get out of here go on get so uh, we'll start off with the magazine pouches now these These are Blackhawk magazine pouches designed for the Surefire 60 round mags, which is this guy. Now if you remember those magazines were all the rage about 10 years ago and Blackhawk made magazine pouches specifically for them that didn't really sell too well. So you can find these on Amazon and uh, eBay for like 15 bucks. Now these were originally the uh, Coyote Tan and I just dyed them green. I didn't use enough dye, uh, I have Rit dye. You're supposed to use one bottle for two pounds. I used one bottle for like four pounds of material, so it didn't turn out that great, but it'll work. Now these are 40 round pack. These are the 40 round magazines. You can fit two in there, and it fits pretty comfortably. All right, uh, moving over here. This is the uh, USMC, I think it's like a Philby uh, hydration pouch system. I don't, I don't know anything about it, but I bought two of these. I bought one full with the uh, bladder in it for like 30 bucks. And then I bought a secondary pouch for like an extra $10. And I put that on the side here as like my dump pouch. And then if I need to ruck up, I can just throw my bladder in there. No big deal. Okay, this is just a USMC Cody Tan um, uh, saw pouch. You know, use this for warming layers, things like that. Just basically utility pouch. I think this was ten dollars. Now this was like fifteen bucks. This is a uh, Camelback uh, bottle pouch. I'm all, I'm a big fan of having two hydration pouches. Have one for uh, you know your main. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Camelback bladder, bladder, but have like some sort of bottle on you as well in case that gets a hole in it and you got some way to hold water. Now this was probably the most expensive one. This was a VCOG, uh, VCOG pouch I'm going to use for my thermal scope. Uh, you know, it's that was not cheap compared to the rest of them. The rest of them I picked up for 10, 15 bucks. Now it's 30 and it's just a big pouch, but it fits my thermal perfectly. Now this, uh, what the hell, dogs. Now this is a Blackhawk 100 round Surefire pouch. If you remember back in the day, you had the Surefire 60 rounders and the Surefire uh, 100 rounders. So the 100 round pouch is quite a bit bigger. And again, it's like 15 bucks. And I got it because you can put a coupled 40 round magazine in it. Pretty nice. And then ended off with just the ACU uh, IFAC pouch, which costs like 10 bucks. Again, dyed it green. Now I try to dye all this stuff green, but again, Rit dye comes in bottles that for uh, about two pounds of fabric, two pounds of nylon, and I was trying to use it on uh, four pounds of material, so it didn't quite work out. So whatever didn't turn completely green, like most of the 
coyote tan stuff just kind of turned like a green tent. I just hit with some green spray paint. No big deal. Now, like I said, this is definitely not a pretty setup, but it's definitely a functional setup. I can hold about eight 40 round magazines, so you're talking carrying, uh, what, 320 rounds of ammunition just on the person. And then if I need to, this is an I, uh, Molly 2 uh, IV bandolier for medics. Each one of those pouches will hold a couple, uh, a coupled 40 round uh, magazines. So all in all, this is a good system. Now, keep in mind weight. This rifle unloaded with no magazine and no optic is 11.2 pounds. When you put the optic on and the magazine, it bumps it up to about 15 pounds even. So you got 15 pounds of rifle and then 320 pounds of uh, ammunition and then, I'm sorry, 320 uh, rounds of ammunition, you know, th this starts adding up quick. So weight is a consideration. Don't consider a weapon system like this unless you are a hoss. <laughs> and if you're going to start adding things like plate carriers, things like that, you're going to be a humongous boat anchor. Everybody's going to hate you and your squad. Now, the dogs are rambunctious again, so I'm going to wrap it up here. I hope you guys enjoyed it and found it informative. Bye.